Section 28 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 28. The Airedale Terrier by F. H. F. Mercer. It requires no slight stretching of the term to include this giant in the same category with the midgets of his genus. It seems unnatural to call a dog standing higher at the shoulder than many foxhounds and weighing 50 to 60 pounds by the same generic title as the three pound black and tan or the sprightly fox terrier. Yet, though he cannot go to earth, the Airedale is an inveterate verminer, and if we call him not a terrier, how else can he be known? Hugh Dalziel, Corsincon, claims the distinction of having christened this rough-and-ready tyke with the pretty name he bears. In the earlier dog shows of the northern counties of England, where specimens first appeared, they were scheduled as broken-haired or working terriers or as waterside terriers by which latter name they were known at home i suggested writes mr dalziel that the name bingley terrier would be a much more distinctive cognomen and applicable inasmuch as bingley seemed to me to be the center around which this terrier was to be met in the greatest numbers several of my correspondents who were breeders and exhibitors suggested to me that Airedale better represented the home of the Terrier. This I adopted, and the name Airedale Terrier has attached to the breed ever since. Close quote. My information, it may be well to mention, derived from a Yorkshireman who has had to do with these Terriers all his life. He is now upward of 50. Fully bears out what Mr. Dalziel has written. As the Airedale was bred by the Yorkshireman simply with a view to getting a rough and ready dog, useful both as a watchdog and by riverside and moor, naturally little or no attention was paid to scientific breeding. A useful dog was bred to a clever bitch, and for years no records were kept of any kind. Consequently, it is impossible to trace the origin of the variety. I am inclined to the belief that there is a strong dash of the otter hound in their composition, backed, perhaps, with some Bedlington, Scotch, and Irish Terrier blood. I know, too, that a dash of the Bull Terrier is frequently introduced to get additional courage. From my small experience of the Airedale, I have found that they possess the highest courage, and my mentor in Airedale matters tells me that they will lick more bull terriers than bull terriers lick them. Indeed, only the other day I received a letter from him saying that the dam of Weaver, the subject of the illustration, when suckling a litter of two week old puppies, fought a bull and terrier bitch for three quarters of an hour. The bull had the upper hand for the first thirty minutes, but then Floss, the Airedale, set to and killed her. His men told him that she wagged her tail all the time and never made a sound, though receiving frightful punishment. The bull and terrier weighed half as much again as she did. Stonehenge gives the breed a very bad name, but I cannot help thinking that the specimens he had to do with were not typical, in disposition at least. And Airedale is not a pretty dog. No one can accuse him of being beautiful but he is such a rough and ready-looking customer, with such a weird head and face, and such human-looking eyes, that one cannot help liking him. I have heard people insist that the Airedale had monkey blood, as he looks more like our ancestor than a dog, and undoubtedly there is a resemblance. When my first Airedale arrived by express, the box in which he was delivered during my absence from home was carefully deposited in the kennel yard. On my return, I was met at the door by the friend who keeps house with me, 
and was told excitedly that an awful-looking brute had come and that he had left it in the box, being afraid to take it out. I went into the kennel yard and there saw this terror-inspiring creature, whom I at once pronounced to be the champion ugly dog of Canada. I let him out and he was as affectionate a little, or rather big fellow, as you could find anywhere. My friends all ridiculed and laughed at him for the first few weeks, but now their feelings have changed, and I am fairly besieged with applications for one of those Airedales. As I am a devoted Spaniel man, I have not yet tested Airedales afield, but I understand they are a most invaluable all-around dog. They can run a deer, a fox, or a hare, beat for feathered game, and kill a rat retrieve a duck, and draw a coon. They are the least quarrelsome of dogs, but when once their wrath is raised, look out for squalls. Something is going to suffer. They are much used by poachers in England, being an improvement on the lurchers of olden days, and moreover less likely to arouse suspicion in the gamekeepers, to whom a lurcher is as a red rag to a bull. He's a queer-looking coon, I overheard a visitor say of an Airedale at show, but he looks like a dandy for work, and I think this breed exemplifies the adage, handsome is as handsome does. They are grand watchdogs and excellent house dogs, kind and affectionate with children, and most intelligent. I am afraid, however, that they will never be popular, looks being so much against them. There are but few of them in the country, and very, very few good ones. The following extract from a letter received lately from an old friend will be of interest in this connection. I will try and write you what I know of Airedales. I think the breed originated from a cross between the Otter Hound and the Bull Terrier. There used to be a pack of Otter Hounds always kept at Bingley, England. I have often seen them hunting on the River Air which runs through Airedale, hence the name of the dog, I suppose. It is good sport to take three or four of these terriers down the banks of a river hunting rats. They will find the rats in their holes and stand back. Then you put in the ferret. The rat will jump into the water and the dogs will watch for this appearance, swim after and catch him nine times out of ten. I think they and the Irish Terriers know more than all their breeds of Terriers combined. I think the breed was first known about Salt Air and Shipley Glen, Bailden, Bingley, and around Cligley. When I wished to get one, I never used to go any other places to look for it, and all the really good ones were well known. I never cared to own any but the best I could get and one pound ten to two pounds was then considered a high price. You could get the best to be had for that amount if the owner would sell it all. I owned three, Smuggler, Crack, and Ben, and they were all good dogs as I ever saw. Ben was the best and the largest of the three. He would probably weigh some forty to forty-five pounds when in good condition. They breed them now much larger than they did then, when I had them, I was about 18 or 20 years old, now 30 years ago and over. Crack was first owned by a Leeds gentleman and weighed not more than 35 pounds when in fair condition. He was matched and fought in the pit in Leeds with a bull terrier weight 33 and one half pounds. Crack was to come at any weight. Bull terrier was to be 32 pounds only but they let him in at above weight. I saw the fight and bought crack for two pounds ten as soon as it was over. Crack outfought him and killed him dead in forty-eight minutes, fought fully as quiet as the bull terrier. He was better grit, for if the bull terrier could, he would have jumped the pit, I think, but crack pinned him and held him until he finished him. Either of the other two, Ben or a Smuggler, would fight just as keen. The Airedale fights much faster than a bull terrier. Their thick hair seems to sicken the dogs they fight with. They are the best watchdogs I know of, and will stand by you in a tight place. 
The dog Charlie that I now have in Maine sleeps in my bedroom on a mat at the door, and no foot can enter the yard but he knows it. No one can cross that threshold at night unless he sees fit to allow it. He is three years old now, and I think is a perfect type of the breed. He is surely game and will hunt rabbits and rats every minute he can get. I think if he was properly trained that few dogs would beat him. He knows no one but his master and completely ignores everyone else. You can teach the Airedale anything. When I was in Europe last time, I saw one that I would have brought over if he could have been bought, but it was of no use, for his owner said fifty pounds would not take him to America. I think he would weigh fully fifty-five to sixty pounds, and knew about as much as you could think a dog could be taught. His owner told me he would dive after a rat like an otter. He could make him stop anywhere, and he said he thought he would stop there until dead or until hunger compelled him to leave. He could send him home with a note and tell him to bring back a reply, and he would do it. And if he said no reply, the dog would take the note and come right back. But if he said answer back, he would bring it or stop until they gave him a piece of paper. He would bring that or whatever they gave him that he could carry, and he would not lose it. He was a perfect pet with children, and a regular guardian over his three-year-old little boy when I sent him out with the child. He reminded me so much of my old Ben. I would have paid well for him, but the owner said, no, my dog is one of my family and will stay with us as long as he lives. Crack, the Airedale I have alluded to before. I have seen point partridges and pheasants as stiff as any old pointer and then he would look around for me as much as to say, I have them here for you, and if one was wounded and run to the ground, he would trail it and bring it to you as sure as it dropped, and he would not injure it. If I wounded a hare or a rabbit, he would surely kill it and then bring it in, but a bird he would bring alive every time. He was brought up on the estate of Sir Busfield Ferrand of Bingley, a thorough sportsman if one ever lived, and Crack had to be sent off, as he would not make friends with the other dogs. He was jealous. He was nearly six years old when he came into my possession. I kept him some three years, and my brother-in-law kept him until his death. He was said to be about fourteen years old when he died, and up to about six months of his death was quite lively. After that he lost the use of his hindquarters partially, and his sight failed him. Smuggler was also a grand dog, but not so game as Ben or Crack. Now I will tell you another true story about another Airedale that my father owned as long as I can recollect anything. His name was Nelson. My father was on horseback and had to cross Spring Mill Brook, some fifteen to twenty feet across, usually about a foot deep. Father used to cross it for a shortcut home. One night his horse stumbled, fell, and threw him, his back striking a rock. He was badly hurt and could not stand. The horse stood waiting for him, but he could not get up. He had lost the use of his lower parts. The dog tried all he could to lift him, but he could not. Then he went to a mill some two hundred yards or more away and brought the night watchman and saved my father's life. He was in the cold water nearly an hour and had all he could do to raise himself on his hands to keep his head above water. The following is the standard for judging Airedale Terriers. Head, value 20. Ears, 8. Neck, shoulders, and chest, 12. Back and loin, 15. Hind quarters and stern, 5. Legs and feet, 15. Coat and color, 20. Weight, 5. Total, 100. Head, skull flat and moderately narrow, tapering slightly to the eyes and free from wrinkle, no perceptible stop or indentation between the skull and the muzzle except in the profile. Jaw, long and powerful, free from flues, rather deep and moderately square at end. Nose black and nostrils large. Mouth, 
Level. Teeth large and sound. Eyes. Small, bright, and dark in color, with terrier expression. Ears. V-shaped, moderate in size and thickness, carried forward as in the case of the fox terrier, and free from long, silky hair. Neck. Fair length gradually widening to the shoulders, well carried and free from throatiness. Shoulders. Fine, long, and sloping moderately into the back. Chest. Should be deep and muscular, but neither full nor wide. Back and loin. The back should be short, straight, and strong. The ribs well sprung and rounded. The loin broad and powerful and well ribbed up. Hind quarters. Strong and powerful. Thick through the hams. Good muscular second thighs and stiffles fairly bent. No tendency to cow hocks. Stern. The tail should be stout and docked, set on rather high but not raised to a right angle with the back. Legs and feet. The legs should be straight and well furnished with bone, the feet round and close, with a thick sole. Coat. Rough or broken and dense and wiry in texture, free from lock or curl. Color. Dark grizzle back, from occiput to end of tail extending also down the sides of the body, with dark markings on the side of the skull. Rest of body a good tan, darker on ears than elsewhere. Weight. Dogs, 40 to 45 pounds. Bitches, 35 to 40 pounds. Disqualifications. A dudley nose. White on throat, face, or feet. White on any other part of the body, objectionable. A thoroughly bad mouth, that is, minus a number of teeth, and others cankered and undershot. Total blindness. Partial blindness objectionable. I may say parenthetically that Airedales of the best breeding sometimes weigh as much as 60 pounds. End of section 28. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona.